We're here on a sunny August day in 2019 with Dr. Hank Dorkin, who was president of the Massachusetts Medical Society from 2017 to 2018. Welcome. Thank you. Let's Glad talk to be about here. your president year. What was on the front burner? Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. No matter what you think is on the front burner, every president that I've known has had other things suddenly materialize that they hadn't entirely planned on. Uh, I guess the number one issue that we were dealing with was the issue of a physician writing a prescription for a lethal dose of medication for a terminally ill adult to take at such time as they see fit. And one of the things that I learned very quickly about that was that there was a great divide between the two factions on that issue. And the first thing we had to get around was the fact that the very title of that statement that I made uh, drew immediate anger mm -hmm. from one or the other. One group felt that this was wrong to call it physician-assisted suicide. It wasn't suicide. It was a rational decision by a dying person. The other group said, how dare you call it medical aid in dying? I've been aiding my dying patients for 40 years. I just don't believe in writing the kind of prescription you're talking about. How dare you say that I'm not aiding my patients? Mm -hmm. And so we got them both to agree on that long-winded definition that I gave you, mm -hmm. because I thought that was more important than what you called it, which was so polarizing. And this was something that had occurred previously uh, uh, in the issue uh, about abortion, with mm -hmm. one group calling itself uh, you know, pro-life and the other group indignant because they felt they were as pro-life. And in fact, we see this going forward now with the concept of Medicare for all. Mm -hmm. Some people are totally polarized by that. When in reality, what they really should be doing is deciding what it is we want everyone in this country to have for medical care and to worry about what we call it later. So this is kind of interesting because you're, you're bringing up a couple of things. On the one hand, you're bringing up the fact that the medical society is very active with regard to advocating for medically associated issues with the government. And on the other hand, the medical society representing so many physicians has to essentially get its own uh, house in order with regard to what it can advocate for and what it can't. Absolutely. Uh, and you, were, you were dealing with a fair amount of conflict there, and, and so part of what you're talking about here is conflict resolution. The president represents the whole medical society. And I testified uh, many times before uh, uh, Beacon Hill panels and was interviewed many times. And one of the best compliments I got from some of our medical society staff were, I've heard you present this several times, and I still don't know which side of the question you come down on personally. Mm -hmm. I said, and that's the what should be for the president of the society who represents everyone and not just one faction or the other. When we set out a survey to all of our members to get their opinions, um, which unfortunately only 13% responded to. They told me I should be happy because usually yeah. it's about 5%. I wanted to see 80%. Right. Um, I was naive. But basically, when I got my anonymous survey, I filled it out according to my own personal beliefs. Yeah. But when I represent the medical society, I have to represent all. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that you learn very quickly during your presidency. Other things that I dealt with, which had been started by uh, certainly Dennis Dimitri and, and Jim Gessner before me, was the whole issue of opioids. Right. And we uh, began to build on some of the excellent work that Dennis had started on evaluating supervised injection facilities. Mm -hmm. And I had the privilege of presenting that uh, material to the uh, Organization of State Medical Society Presidents, OSMAP, at uh, uh, the AMA meeting. I also had the uh, interesting opportunity to, uh, at the request of the uh, Boston City Councilors, uh, to come and testify when they were holding uh, testimony on supervised injection facilities. Um, and basically, they uh, were not interested at the time and thought it was actually a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember coming out of there uh, relatively intact and being interviewed by a TV camera from one of the T 
TV station that says, Doctor, uh, one of the, the local business people said that doctors should be ashamed of suggesting something like this. Are you ashamed? And I looked at her and I said, um, doctors are never ashamed when they're attempting to save lives. Mm -hmm. And doctors are never ashamed when they're attempting new ways to save lives when the old ways aren't working. So no, we're not ashamed for suggesting supervised injection facilities. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, over the past couple of years, there has been a swing now, uh, even from people that initially were uh, not in favor of it, such as Mayor Walsh, to saying this is really something we need to look at as a potential option because of how well this has worked in Vancouver, right. in Montreal, and parts of Canada and Europe. And I'm the first to admit that when I first heard of supervised injection facilities, I didn't think it was a great idea. Right. But then I did something that they taught me to do at Hopkins. I read the data. And once you read the data, they're very compelling. And at that point, it became something to really consider. And recently, as this week, uh, some state legislators have come out again in favor of a pilot program in Massachusetts. And what we wanted was a pilot program. We didn't want it set up in every nook and cranny around the Commonwealth, we figured one or two uh, in locations to be chosen by the Department of Public Health. We mm -hmm. at the Medical Society did not think it was appropriate for us to make that decision. We were happy to work with them to sort it out. But that basically, um, after the state looked at it, and wanted to try it, and where they thought we would support it every way we could. And I think the third issue, which we were just getting into at the end of my presidency, uh, not that it hadn't been an issue before, but it was building, was the issue of physician burnout. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were approached by the Mass Hospital and Health Association to put together a working group. Uh, and I asked then uh, President-elect uh, Shawi and Vice President Bamba to represent the Medical Society at that meeting. And they have had great success right. uh, with the publications in conjunction with the School of Public Health. Uh, in addressing this issue. We're far from having solved it, but certainly we're moving in the right direction. Yeah. So these were the big issues during your president year. And you also encountered some other things that you represented uh, the society or worked with the society on, such as uh, interoperability with electronic medical records. Uh, what can you say about that? <laughs> um, it was interesting. Uh, we started to look at interoperability when I was uh, vice president. Mm -hmm. And actually, I, I can't say we started. I mean, I got into it at that mm -hmm. point. It had already been percolating along. And uh, one of the advantages I had was that uh, uh, Leon Barzin from our Committee on Information Technology was uh, completely au courant with this and mm -hmm. knew exactly uh, what the issues were. And the one thing that I did was I said, let's, let's call the AMA and find out what they're doing about it, because I don't want to reinvent the wheel. And so he and I called the AMA, and they said, well, as a matter of fact, we recently held a town hall mm -hmm. in Atlanta, Georgia, and we had a bunch of physicians from the community come in and give us their opinions about the problems with EHRs. And, and I said, right then and there, I said, if you ever have a second town hall, it's going to be here in, mm -hmm. in Boston the Boston metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. And we talked some more, and, and Leon and I thought that it went well. And I think it couldn't have been more than, than a week or two later that we got a call back from the AMA that said, um, the good news is we're going to have a second town hall, mm -hmm. and we're going to have it with you all in, in Waltham. Um, the bad news is I think they gave us two weeks mm -hmm. <laughs> to put it all together. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we scrambled. but. We got it done, and with uh, uh, Steve Stack, then president of the AMA, uh, he and I moderated it. And it was impressive the number of people who are physicians in the Mass Medical Society who had already done a great deal of work on the electronic health record, who some of them had programmed their own, mm -hmm. uh, many of which worked very well until they reached a certain level where they would have to do certain regulatory uh, actions that were either too expensive or too time-consuming for them to continue it. Right. But these were not people. The, one of the major points that was made at that meeting was these are not people that are 
uh, afraid of technology or not interested. These are people that are often at the front of it. Right. But basically, as the EHR was constructed and as the regulations were evolving, they were completely inimicable to actually getting the job done without overwhelming the physicians. Right. And then the next thing that happened was that uh, uh, acting CMS commissioner uh, from Washington uh, uh, was invited to Boston and instead of taking him the usual route where we take them to the academic medical centers downtown, we brought him out to uh, the office of uh, one of the members of our committee, our task force, mm -hmm. and sat him down and showed him exactly what the requirements uh, were doing for meaningful use to the doctor-patient re re uh, interaction. And to his credit, he said, Mike, this is absolutely not what we wanted. This is the antithesis of it. Right. We have to fix it. And that was one of the things that led to the, not rapid enough, but the demise of meaningful use as it had been constructed to move on to other things. Mm -hmm. um, the issue still isn't fully resolved. We are losing large numbers. We're at a time when we don't have enough physicians in the United States. Mm -hmm. We clearly need more. And at a time like that, many physicians are retiring from the practice of medicine years earlier than they would have right. simply because they, they find that it's overwhelming to deal with the EHR. We used to say that in, in, in my generation, you, you worked at the hospital, you came home, you fed the kids, you put them to bed, uh, and then you sat down with the journals and you read the literature and that's how you kept up. Right. And now, to a large extent, we find that house staff and young physicians go home, have dinner, feed the kids, put them to bed, and then they open up the electronic medical record and try to fix the problems with the EHR that they couldn't fix while they were in clinic right. with the patient. Right. And of course the patients say the doctor didn't look at me at all during right. my encounter, they just had their head buried in the computer. Right. So, you know, there are potentially some good things that can come out of the EHR, but right now it, well, most physicians constantly for the past number of years when asked the number one thing that led to physician burnout or was discouraging for them in the practice was the EHR. Right. Last year, for the first time, something passed it, prior approval. Uh -huh. And prior approval had passed it, but not by that much. And so the difference between them, it's like the difference between uh, K2 and Everest. If you have to climb either one, it's really a moot point. Right, right. So. Um Basically, we're at a point right now where technology is more of a problem than a solution, or at least the EHR technology, and it's, it's probably uh, going to improve, uh, and it's going to do so as a result of a lot of the efforts of the AMA and the Mass Medical Society and the work that you've done. Absolutely. Um, but it's, it's worth noting, at least at this point in time, that for a lot of people, it's, it's uh, not made their work easier, it's made it harder. Yeah. It um, was touted originally as a tool to make life easier for the doctor when in reality the EHR was more of a glorified billing weapon. Right, right. So uh, other issues or other experiences, I, I would say that you bring up a number of things here, which is that you uh, have a lot of exposure to the media, you have a lot of work with regard to public relations and, and the like, and uh, did you find that your experience as an officer here uh, enhanced your abilities in these fields? Well, you know, as a full-time faculty member, first at Tufts and, and now at Harvard, uh, you get a lot of time standing up in front of a lot of people speaking. Oh, okay. So that aspect wasn't a problem. And I even proved to my wife once and for all that I can speak without slides, <laughs> although she's still skeptical. Um, but, you know, you have to learn to, to think on your feet as you do in the ICU mm -hmm. when you're rounding there. Uh, and I did learn that you have to answer the question as best you can and not turn it into a lecture. Mm -hmm. I remember when uh, one of my, uh, the father of one of my son's classmates, uh, Bob Reich, was Secretary of Labor and I'd watch him at a news conference and they'd ask a question and Bob would answer it and then they'd, they'd ask it. They were going in one direction and Bob would wear his professorial hat and say, well, I didn't make it clear the first time. I think I, I'll, I'll try it a different. 
Bob, that's not what they were after. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they weren't after the lecture. They had a particular point they were going after, and so I learned that from, mm -hmm. from, from watching him. And, um, uh, you know, for instance, uh, the one thing you, you, you can't do is you can't react emotionally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because you don't think as clearly if you do that. I remember one of the Boston City Councilors saying, Doctor, will you go with me to the mayor of Newton and say you want this supervised injection facility across the street from your house in Newton? And um, <coughs> I, I, I thought and said, uh, well, if the Department of Public Health, looking around the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. determined that the most advantageous site for public health in Massachusetts was directly across the street from my house in Newton, yes, I would go with you to do that. Um, I, I'm not sure um, if that counselor uh, thought that uh, my only exposure was living in Newton, Massachusetts, compared to what he dealt with in downtown Boston. What he failed to understand was that I am a 1966 graduate of the Woodrow Wilson Senior High School in Camden, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And I'll match what we had to deal with in Camden with anything that he had to deal with mm -hmm. in Boston. 